Welcome to Opiate Recovery. Opiate Recovery podcast gives you an inside look at an addiction recovery support group. This group is composed of people who've been addicted to opiate painkillers or heroin and is facilitated by me, an addictions counselor. These group members share a commonality. They all utilize medication-assisted treatment in the form of methadone or suboxone. These podcasts are designed for education and support purposes only and are not therapy. The views expressed in the podcasts are the opinions of each member and do not reflect an official position of the treatment clinic. If you'd like to ask the group a question or suggest a topic, or if you'd like to join us, please email us at info at opiatesupportgroup.com. That's I-N-F-O at opiatesupportgroup.com. Welcome. Could you each state your first name? My name is Carrie. Trish. Jason. Rob. All right. Welcome. Let's talk about women's issues. Um, this I ran into this article and it's sad, really. Um, it says, in the opioid epidemic, breastfeeding emerges as a possible crime. Have you ever thought about moms who are using and uh, do you know some moms who continued to use? And breastfeed? And then breastfeed. No, I've never known any mom that's, I mean, even my sister used to throw out her breast milk when she drank a beer at night, so, but I've never known anyone in the drug game that ever breastfed while they were using. That's awful. I never knew anybody that was even pregnant during that period of time. Yeah, I knew just people with kids. I didn't know any. I didn't know a lot of people that were pregnant or well, had we've young had, children like that. We've had some women here, mm-hmm. you know, in treatment that um, stayed mm-hmm. on the methadone. Babies were healthy. Everything's mm-hmm. fine, and I believe they were encouraged to breastfeed. Um, so I think that's okay. But yeah, here, methadone. But I, I yeah, if you're shooting heroin uh, in your system, I wouldn't think it'd be. <laughs> That doesn't uh, hurt the, the unborn child. I mean, I noticed several mothers who have come in here, been in here to treatment, and I always wondered if that would be a problem when they were born, or if they had issues, or. Well, I'll tell you. In this article, it says that the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine and other groups agree that a woman who is on methadone maintenance therapy should be encouraged to breastfeed. There is very low transfer of methadone in breast milk, and there are true benefits to breastfeeding. Their babies have less withdrawal symptoms, and they're easier to soothe. Actually, the the women that are pregnant on methadone, um, like my sister works at a methadone clinic down in Georgia, and uh, they actually say that if you try to get off methadone or stop taking heroin when you're pregnant, you could lose the baby. So they suggest when people are, like when, like, if, say, a new pregnant woman comes here for treatment, that's the best thing she could do, right? Because right. she could eventually lose her baby if she doesn't yeah. stay on some kind of opioid. It's about stabilizing the chemical the environment stuff, already right? present. Yes, yes. You know, the baby was conceived in this chemical environment. Now don't go strip it of these chemicals. Just maintain it and then give birth to it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, because if you take a pregnant woman... Well, I guess you've just said this, and they abruptly stop heroin, yep. mm-hmm. you're putting the baby at risk. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the, I mean, even the mom's not at risk for death per se, but she, you know, she's going to be stressed and miserable too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, both of them are going to be. Yeah. And in many cases, you have to increase your dose of methadone rather than decrease. Right. Yeah, and there, I'm on this um, opioid uh, or methadone maintenance um talk thing on on Facebook like a, you know where you can ask questions and stuff and you'd be surprised how many people don't realize that like like you, you people like see a pregnant woman at a methadone clinic you're probably thinking what the heck is she doing there but it's actually better that they're here than mm-hmm. they're not mm-hmm. but a lot of people ask questions about that kind of stuff because they don't realize that it's a good thing <laughs> mm-hmm. you know you know here's a little known secret um that once, like if you're on Medicaid, um, a clinic, well, excuse me, that a clinic is not supposed to turn away a pregnant woman, period. Oh. 
So whatever kind of situation they have financially, if they can't afford it, you can't kick them out. Wow. Is that methadone or any clinic? I, any clinic, I believe. You, you know, you are obligated to give that baby a chance. Wow, that's so well, cool. So if they come in and they can't pay, you have Or they to... just stop paying. You know, yeah. that you can't and, kick them out. No, wow. and if so, that's why I say it's a secret that I have just put out to yeah. the world now. That if, <laughs> you know, that if somebody comes in and they say, "Well, well I don't want to pay anymore," well, then no, they, you can't do anything. Yeah. No wonder they keep it secret because then people would use it as a you know, if Free people value. knew that going in, they could manipulate the the clinic. You know. Yeah. Oh, I, didn't, I know I can't pay, so get me pregnant quick so I can go in there and get free treatment. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Boy, I hope that. I heard, well, that's I the same. That that's happen. the same mentality that these multi generation welfare families are on. Oh, mm-hmm. have a bunch of kids and get checks for each kid and all that. You know. Mm-hmm. So people do think low like that. Mm-hmm. People do. Well, I hope that's not certainly often. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so yeah. anyway, so back to this article, there's, um, uh, says a woman may be accused of murder by breastfeeding, uh, it says, this was just in July 24th, this article was written, and it says earlier this month, a 30-year-old woman was charged with criminal homicide in the death of her 11-week-old son. An autopsy found that the infant died from a lethal combination of methadone, amphetamine, methamphetamine, uh, allegedly transferred through the breast milk. So she's a poly drug user. Yeah. She's abusing all of the drugs, and she's breastfeeding her kid. If she were just on methadone, doing it correctly, Mm -hmm. her kid wouldn't have died. So they're going to try to throw the methadone baby out with the bathwater, like they always try to do, you know. To, to I, blame it on the methadone. Yeah, 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 I've, yeah, I've known some mothers that have had children here that their babies didn't have any methadone in their system. Yeah. Like, they didn't even have to stay in the hospital long. They were out within three to four days. And then I've known other mothers that they have to stay two weeks. It just depends. But for that mother to do that, knowing she was on all those other drugs, that's awful. Yeah. Well, it's ignorant. It's, it's ignorant. very ignorant. It's yeah. ignorant. Yeah, she might not have even known. She might have that's just assumed. Sad. You know, not everyone's an expert on human yeah. biology. Yeah. You know, she might not yeah. realize that what she eats and consumes transfers through the breast milk. She might just think that it just forms there in the breast and it's milk, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, apparently this is not an isolated case. This has happened in South Carolina, California, and Washington. And are they all being charged with something? Wow. Yeah. Did. I'm sure they all had other drugs in their system, though, right? They didn't. You know, it doesn't say about the other states. Um, But it says, well, this, you know, kind of goes hand in hand with the debate over whether uh, people who use substances should be punished or should they be helped. Um, So a lot of these women are being criminalized, um, charged with child abuse. In some cases, just because the newborn was treated for withdrawal symptoms. Um, So then it goes on to talk about some people uh, who are just on methadone or suboxone may also be subject to criminal cases if the baby has uh, any kind of withdrawal symptoms. That's sad because no wonder women that's get going over the line. Right? Yeah, because yeah. women are scared if you get if you get pregnant while you're on methadone, you're already frightened. And now you got to be oh, more yeah. frightened when you have the baby because you're afraid mm-hmm. someone's going to take it away when you're trying to do the right thing to mm-hmm. begin with. Well, that's, that, I, I really do feel for women in the world because they're damned if they do, they're damned if they don't, you know. Uh, this, the, this part of society says, have your baby no matter what. This part of society says, kill the baby no matter what. This part of the society says, you know, it's like you, you, there's no winning, mm-hmm. you know. There's just no winning. You could do everything perfect and boom, some something is... Pointed out and wrong. Mm-hmm. Somebody's gonna have a problem with it. <laughs> yeah, you make the best choice. You know yeah. how to make based on what the people that you listen to, or based much. on your own <laughs> moral standards or whatnot. And yeah. Well, so there's this other article called "Gender Differences in Drug Use uh, Often a Barrier to Help." 
What do you think the differences are between men and women when it comes to addiction? I think men have more control than what women have over their addiction. Like in what way? Just uh, being able to control uh, to continue using. I mean, a lot of women that I've been around just, you know, they just keep going and going and, and like, like smoky crack, I mean, I mean, it's like, you know, they can't go spend $20 or $30. I mean, they, they spend every penny they got, then they go to extreme means of, of getting more. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, you know, and I don't know, I don't know what it is about, you know, women that do that. I mean, I mean. Yeah. What do you think it is? Have others had that experience or did you disagree? I, no. I have had that experience, but I'm not going to say that this is every woman's experience. Yeah, you know, not I, every There are obviously of, yeah. men that are worse than women. Right, are, yeah. But uh, when I was in an environment where I was using with a female roommate, uh, she could not manage anything. You know, it was off the deep end all the time. It was never like, okay, let's do this little bit of free base before we go to work, and then we'll work, and then we'll come home and do more free base. No, it's, let's free base now, let's be late for work, let's show up to work completely jacked, get kicked out of work, then go back home and free base more. You know what I mean? It's like they couldn't, <laughs> not they, but she couldn't, uh, she couldn't sustain it, you know? She couldn't just, okay, here's where we plateau, and then we get high again, you know? It was just always higher, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. And it was like a death wish, like a death wish to burn out, uh, not a wish to get high for the longest amount of time. You know, for me, it was how can I be high for the longest amount of time? Mm -hmm. Well, that means I can't indulge at certain points. Right. But she was just indulgent, indulgent, indulgent. Mm -hmm. you know? But that's because I was the one having to go out and work. I was the one having to come up with the money. I was the one having to make sure the house ain't getting taken from us, you know. But she could just kind of lay around and get high all day, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then if I wasn't willing to pay for these things anymore, she could just find some other guy who's willing to pay for it or sell her body, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. I think that all is is relevant in the difference between men and women, you know. A man knows that if it comes down to it, he can't go on the corner and sell himself for yeah. a, hit of, a hit of drugs. <laughs> but a girl knows that if it did come down to it, she yeah. would, you know. Well, some men do. And some men do, yeah, absolutely. But I think it's just more upfront. It's more obvious to a woman that that's a potential, you know. And, and, and they all know it, and all men know it, you know. Yeah. There was even times I was with the girl I loved, and I would I would suggest her, why don't you just go out and get us some drug, you know, do what you got to do, you know, and because yeah. you know, it's like I can't go out and do it, so you have to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not like in Glenn. Yeah. I I I completely <laughs> agree with what Jason was saying though. Um, because I know if my husband was here, he would say that I was always wanting to overindulge, and he would always be the one pulling me back. Yeah. Going, what about? This afternoon, I'd be like, screw this afternoon. I want to get high now. You so know? you agree with this? I do. I to mean, I was extent. always, I mean, I, I was over, always overindulging. I think I even just said that before we started the podcast where I had to stop smoking marijuana because I overindulge in that too. I can't, you know, it's, mm -hmm. I overindulge in any kind of drug I do. I mean, it, you, even not with the drugs, like drinking even, you know, when every female I'd ever been with drank more than me, always out drank me would be reckless when they're drinking, would sleep around when they're drinking. I mean, it's almost like their brain shuts off and they just go with it. And and I would always wonder, how is this possible? Because we live together, we think together, we, you know, we're on the same page here, but when alcohol comes in our system or drugs comes in the system, you're completely out of control and I'm still able to have some semblance of right and wrong, uh, you know, it's limits, uh, you know, control, yeah, a, a degree of Even control. when you were in late stage addiction. Yeah. Even in late stage, yes. Mm -hmm. There was still extremes I, I was able to not do that yeah. most people would just succumb to, and it's like... It's like we had a limit. We if there a, was a choice... Line, you you know. Yeah, right. And See, my line I didn't cross was the sex. I would never, I never had sex with anyone for drugs, but I was also married with the man I was using my drugs with, but... I would go into someone's house and steal 
Yeah. Right. My husband wouldn't. I would be the one that I would be the one so desperate that I would yeah. go and do other things. And in a way, it's because you're dependent on your husband to have enough dope for your desire. You know? Yeah. And he can't provide that because he's got to help himself. Too. Yeah. So when I was in a relationship, it was like. I'd come home, I'd have the dope for us, and we'd divvy it up, of course, down to the micro-nano level. <laughs> and then uh, it would still be a fight, and it would still be this and that. And and I would have to save some for the morning because I had to go to work, but she would take that line while I'm sleeping because she didn't have to go to work. So then I wake up sick, and I have to, you know, it, it's like, it, yeah, it can definitely get out, get crazy between men and women in addiction. It's, it's a joke. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I've, I've even known husbands that have, like you said, t- told their wives to like, go out there on the corner and make us some money for some drugs. You know, I mean, it happens a lot more than I think people want to admit. Or sadly, parents who pimp out their children. Oh, oh my goodness. I was just talking to a girl the other day that said, you wouldn't believe how many women I was in prison with that either hurt their children or sold their children. Mm. Or they knew their hu- their boyfriends were sleeping with their own children, but mm. they kept them anyways. Mm. I don't have children, so I have a stepson that I love to death. I couldn't imagine anyone hurting him. Like, I just couldn't imagine selling your child to somebody. Mm, Or letting it happen, knowing they were being hurt like that. All right, let me read this. Um, It says, women tend to develop substance abuse problems faster than men and relapse under different circumstances. Mm -hmm. Pressures of caregiving, a history of abuse, and even biological factors make them more uh, resistant than men to seek help. That's interesting. Well, that kind of makes sense. If you're the, if you're the mom trying to take care of kids, very hard to go get yourself help. Mm -hmm. Because you're so used to helping everyone else, type thing. Like for me, I was you can't leave your kids alone. I was always the one working full time, so it for me, like I couldn't leave because, like, anytime. We talked about getting treatment. I wanted him to go because he was the one that wasn't working, you know. And I didn't think there was treatment that I could go to unless I went to an inpatient treatment. I didn't know about methadone back then. Mm. Um, so, let's see. It says, um, it's talking about this particular woman who was a mom and she was paralyzed with guilt and shame, which kept her from treatment. You know, how can mm-hmm. I do this to my kids? Pressures of caregiving, a history of abuse, and biological factors are challenges faced by women in addiction, making them more resistant to seek help, national research has found. While the death toll for men and women dying from overdoses continues to climb, growing research shows clear gender differences in why they use patterns of behavior during their use and in the pathways to treatment and recovery. A number of women in Bucks County, you know, this doesn't say where, Bucks County where, um, who have died from drug overdoses tripled in the last decade from 13 in 2008 to 57 in 2017. Um, Women are more likely to relapse in the presence of a romantic partner than men are and are less likely to relapse when they're alone. What do you think is going on there? It said we're more likely to um, to relapse in the presence of a romantic partner. Less like, likely to relapse when they're alone. That part makes sense. Well, Less I could see using to... if like I could if you're in a new relationship and say you, like I was clean and the guy was using like maybe just like go along with what they're doing because you love them. Yeah. You think they're yeah. looking out best for you. They wouldn't do anything to hurt me. It's just going to be this one time. I think. Thing. I <laughs> think another way to say it is maybe women have more of a need for acceptance and validation from others. You know, they need mm-hmm. to be given mm-hmm. attention and. and kindness and they have to like have it manifest to know that it's there you know a man can sit in a room with strangers not even know their names and accomplish things with them and do things with them and then leave and it's like oh yeah dude yeah he's a dick you know like uh so i think women yeah they're a little more relational you know they're relational mm-hmm. men, the men bonding are, you know yeah. in, more independent maybe in detached a way. yeah detached is a better yeah. better word yeah, so then it goes on and talks about um, women having uh, trauma histories that require special programs. So the most significant difference between men and women is the role of trauma. As many as 80% of women seeking treatment have a history of sexual or physical abuse or both. 
men experience trauma as well, but it's a critical factor for women when it comes to risk for addiction and effectiveness of treatment. That's crazy. It's that many. I was never sexually or physically abused. And I just, yeah, I can't your believe Your ACEs it. score was zero, right? Yeah. You had nothing I had nothing. Yeah, other than the reason that I just wanted to get high, I guess. <laughs> I mean, but I, I have no, like, thing that happened hey, in my you, past. But you never know. You no. might have repressed memories that I have been I fun. No, I mean, really. So I, I've heard of people <laughs> with repressed memories. But, yeah, I, as far as I remember, I don't remember ever anyone touching me inappropriately or anything. So, so you got lucky. Yeah, because I think my addiction would have started out, I didn't start getting... I had my first addiction when I was like 20. I don't think I, I think it would have started back in high school, but I just kept away from people that did drugs in high school purposely. <laughs> I should have done that in my 20s. <laughs> right. It's amazing how many, if you've ever watched the show Intervention, how many of those people that are, have had, women have been sexually molested or abused mm -hmm. that, that triggered their. Yes, yeah, you just said 80 percent, right? Of yeah. people in it, of women in addiction. That's great. That's women a that's huge amount. I believe it. I mean, I, I honestly thought I was maybe a conservative estimate because, I mean, you know, addiction doesn't just, you know, it's you know, you're not living your life and saying, you know, this just needs to be higher. Yeah, you know, I, I just need heroin to make this worth living. Uh, you know, it's obvious people doing drugs have trauma that they're trying to met that they're trying to mend. You know, uh, poorly. Yes, and, and it's they shouldn't be punished. They should be helped definitely. Yeah, but yeah, well, and it's, a, it's one in four women have been abused in their lifetime, and uh, I think it's one in one in ten. Maybe and of course, men. saying that, I mean, define abuse, define woman, define you know. I mean, because, <laughs> because technically, I can throw on a dress and be a woman. Right There's now, a lot of gray know? areas there. Uh, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> obviously, I don't believe that. But that's what society would like us to believe. Okay, but so what do you think about specialized treatment? Um, I don't. Sex rest. I don't think we have enough <laughs> people in our clinic to really get a group off the ground, but it does seem like a good idea. And when you when you hear about AA, NA, they go to women's meetings, and that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, like in Celebrate Recovery, yeah, they, they split up the men's Yeah, they women. do. They mm -hmm. do. And at first I thought it was really weird, but the more I thought about it, because they don't deal with just addiction. They yeah, deal with, a lot of it is sexual. I mean, uh, yeah. being abused I, sexually. I would, have, I would assume majority yeah. of it is not drug related. It's not. Therefore, really. it's kind of inappropriate for a bunch of men who potentially have abused women, potentially, in a room with abused women sharing their abuse. And how can the man really feel bad for that when he himself has done it to someone else? And maybe he has guilt that he's trying to deal with about having done that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's messy. Yeah. So I, I think it's a good idea that they do that. And I totally didn't understand it at first. Yeah, and a lot of the women, like, because I went to celebrate recovery for a couple of years, when I noticed that a lot of the women wouldn't even, would like stop talking when men would walk up to us like in a group, like before we went to our small groups. Oh, they're because they, timid. Because they're just, timid. They they're wouldn't want the, yeah, they wouldn't want them to hear something they said because, I mean, they talk about very personal things that yeah. I wouldn't want to say in front of a man or, you know. Yeah. You just, you talk about different things yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you're around a, a, yeah. a peers, you know, of your own sex. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of stuff that is just private gender-based kind of thing yeah, yeah. no exactly they, i yeah. would feel much more comfortable saying in a group of women yeah. versus if there was one man in the room you wouldn't say it i mean a lot of us prefer a woman doctor i know? do mm -hmm. you know it's just because that's private stuff yes <laughs> okay here's another article called uh opioid epidemic responses overlook gender uh, it says, women and men are not identical, and we must treat all people with attention to their specific risks and clinical needs. Women have a greater sensitivity to pain than men and are more likely than men to begin their misuse of opioids through medical treatment. Women are more likely to be prescribed opioids with other medications that increase the likelihood of an overdose. Um, I was a little surprised to hear that, that women are, have a greater sensitivity to pain because you, most women would complain about their whining husbands, you know, mm -hmm. that they have a toothache and they act like they're going to die, mm -hmm. you know, and women tend to just get up and take care of things anyway. Um, 
Yeah, there's even that commercial, mm-hmm. like, what, I think it's like a night quill commercial when the woman's sick. Like, a man's yeah. sick, he, he gets to take the day off. Yeah. But if a woman's sick, you still got to get them, get their kids ready for school and make lunches yeah. and all that stuff. <laughs> so maybe that's just a myth, huh? Yeah. Or the, um... Well, I've, there's met, a lot of I've single tattooed dads out there. a lot of men and a lot of women. I'll tell you, women suck at dealing with pain. Oh. But I oh. think it's different types of pain. You know, if, if you know, uh, you know, getting a tattoo is different than a toothache. You know, getting a piercing is different than, you know, you're doing something by choice versus something that's naturally occurring. You have no control over it. You know, I think um, that when it comes to, like, tattooing and stuff, men definitely sit better for tattoos, long-term tattoos, hours of tattoo work. Mm. I'd rather tattoo a man than a woman because she's going to be squirming and she's going to be a little more dramatic and, you know, and I get it, whatever, but a man is uh, more likely to be able to sit there in silence and take it and... Yeah, and culturally, you're, you know, you're told don't, you know, well, yes, boys I, don't cry. It's a huge and, social thing because you're, yeah. you're in public, you're de- enduring with pain, and you can't show, uh, you know, any sort of acknowledgement yeah. that it hurts, you know, otherwise you're a pussy or a yeah, or whatever. I, I don't think most any guys could handle childbirth, given, I think, I've heard that's, yeah, I don't, I I'd say when it comes to that, women have that all. So I think that's probably why I haven't had children. I think yeah, that just scares the hell out of know, me. Too. And <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> this is interesting though because uh, <laughs> I've had girls who get tattooed tell me they'd rather give birth than get a tattoo, mm. and I'm thinking that is crazy because I thought that was like the one definite non-argument that women were yeah. strong and better because they push babies out of them, uh, and it's like. I've had many, many females say they would rather have give birth than get a tattoo. But that's because they get kind of birth. Well, exactly. Or not. exactly. <laughs> some babies just well, pop right out. And see, some. this is the point, though. Everybody's experience of pains are different. Yes. So I don't think men or women have yeah. a general better or worse thing. I think it's to the individual and the pain they're feeling and why they're feeling it. Yeah, but I would agree with this that I would think that most doctors would be more likely to give a woman an opiate, you know, than a man, because, oh, you you tough can just it tough it yeah. out. But the woman, oh. Well, when, when my husband and I were down in Florida, you know, working, uh, trying to get the pills from the pill mills down there, like, we, I would have, I could get pills quicker versus him. Like, if I, we went to the same doctor, and he gave me probably four times as strong of the medication mm. as they gave to my husband. Wow. And we went in there the same way, both with a cane. We didn't go in the same day or anything, but like, the, yeah, they gave me something four times the amount of what they gave him. Wow. And, and it was kind of like that anywhere. I went to a doctor one time for, I think it was like my annual or something, and I mentioned I had a toothache, and she gave me 30 hydrocodones because I had a toothache. I wasn't there for my toothache. Mm. But she saw how much pain I was in, and she fe- and it was a woman, and she felt bad, mm. and so she gave me yeah. pain pills. And this was like ten yeah. years ago, before they were really bad. People didn't think that, you know, that they would have this epidemic. Yeah, they're compassionate; mm-hmm. they don't want to see yes. the pain. But I could see how that would lead to more women being addicted. Yeah, because you know you right. can kind of play the game. A Society little bit too. has greater sympathy for the ailing woman, <laughs> therefore yes. yeah, we and- end up screwing them because we give them more more. Uh, Right, and it, this article doesn't talk about it, but I've read before that it um, that in terms of race also, no, I bet black men I bet. are far less likely to be given any kind of a painkiller. Oh yeah, yeah. I thought we I believe it. endure more pain than than a man. We were well, just talking about that. Yeah, I guess that's the. I don't know. Good boy. I would say I can endure more pain than my... <laughs> Who's tougher, man or woman? Yeah. Than my husband. I mean, I've always heard that. But yeah. I mean. Okay, let's see. It says, women exposed to an addictive substance develop a drug use disorder more rapidly than men. Women seeking treatment for opioid addiction also suffer increased limitations in their social and work lives, reducing their ability to maintain em- employment and housing. This compounds negative effects for children and families because women are most often the primary caregivers. 
See, and I guess that's what I'm thinking back on, too. Like, anytime I would see children around, they were usually with their moms. But that's only because the moms had full custody. If the guys had full custody, they would have been roaming around with the dads. Yeah. But, you know, I've had to go in other rooms before and while the, the moms tell their kids to stay out there in the other room and stuff. And it's just, it's sad. It is sad. Yeah. They say many substance use interventions are developed around treating men. Women are less likely to enter traditional treatment programs. Women only programs show better involvement and often better results. And I don't know that we've really thought about that much at this clinic. We just sort of do what we do and do it to both genders and hope for the best, I guess. Well, it's never been an issue either. You know, and you've never had a woman say, hey, why don't we have women-only groups? No one's ever mentioned it, really. I mean, I don't mind. I mean, we've been coming here for a couple of years, so anything that I say in front of a woman, I don't really mind saying in front of any of these guys. Yeah. Uh, but it's a good it's good food for thought. It is. I mean, it'd be yeah. something maybe we would you could ask some of the other patients if it's something that they would like to happen. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of maybe the more the girls would come up to say they would want separate more than the guys. I don't know. I don't think do guys really care. Do you, I mean, would you guys talk about things differently if we weren't in the room? No, because I, I mean, they talked about everything from you know, sex stuff. Yeah, we've whatever. talked. I mean, we, even when so. we had that sex ed thing come in here, like we were all in a room together. Yes. So, yeah. We did a podcast on women's issues when it just happened that we, I think we had four or five women in the group, oh. no men. So okay. It was a nice opportunity to <laughs> yeah. talk about women's issues. Well, I was just going to say, too, though, like I bet you a lot of the stuff that people hypothetically would uh, reserve to speak of in that group setting with all the same sex is probably dealt with in the personal sessions with the counselors, you know, like, yeah. you know, we have our groups mm -hmm. and then, but we also have issues that we don't do in group, we do with our personal counselor. Yeah. And I think that's probably why there's not like a, a visible need for a sexed group because everyone's basically taken care of individually yeah. and then we come as a group to do this. And know? we don't have any male counselors either. I just thought about that. Have you guys ever had a male counselor? Uh, not at this clinic, but the others oh, okay. do. I just realized they're all female. But there's a number of things we could do different. I'm still kind of pushing for dividing um, groups into risk level. Mm, yeah. I think that's kind of oh. important immediately, yes. in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it's hard, you know, when you've got... It multiple is. payers and you've got you know, it is and, and you know in in some ways you know the more at risk do benefit from groups with less at risk people mm -hmm. because we have wisdom and time under our belt to share with them and maybe if they're expressing something they're unhappy with someone who's been there done that can explain yeah I see why you're angry but long term blah 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 this and that things are fine you know uh and if you were to just segregate them based on high risk, well, a room full of high risk people with no experience there to, you know, what, they're just gonna all just well, hopefully be at the, high the risk counselor, together. the counselor yeah. is well, the one with the experience. Well, I get that, but I'm saying, yeah. you know, but the research shows that the, um, it, how do I say this? That uh, if you have that everybody sort of drops down to the lowest denominator. Yeah, so right. So the people. You know, People you, get corrupted, not better, when they're around. Right, right. So influence. somebody, yeah. you know, high functioning group, and you get the low functioner or higher risk person, that's going to drag down people instead yeah. of bringing them up. Right. And I know that not like, always, but. when I was going through my, like my relapse, it was it was good for me to be in a group that with people that were just starting because honestly, I would look at some people and be like, I don't want to go back to that. Mm. Like, I mean, they were just starting, so maybe they were still using a little bit recreationally, yeah. but it's good for, and like you said, the new, the newer people to see the older people are have come far in life in the past couple of years since being on methadone. Yeah. Like you said, it's good food for thought. Yeah. All right. Anything else we want to say about gender differences? Thanks for sharing.